Three, two. I got everybody pregnant with Barry Katz and semen. I'm not comfortable with the tone this is taking. If you're undeniable, you will not be denied. If you want to be successful in show business, you get yourself a Jew white manager like Barry Katz. <laughs> Being a manager is just turning no's into yeses. Creating holy shit moments. Uh, undeniable. You fucking firing me up, Katz. I love this man. Is there anything else I should know? You're on. What? Now I'm on the air. Barry Katz. Back in the house. 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 Let's do this. Do this. Hey, everybody. Very exciting day. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my guest today, a man who is a fiber, who are the cells, who is the blood of my history in this business. We have intertwined throughout the entire journey. And for the first time ever, we're sitting down. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Orny Adams. Thank you. Good to see you, brother. I'm going to try and figure out what that intro was. What? Uh... Hey, listen, I've known you since I, you were in Boston. I remember in Boston, you got to recreate it for the audience. You, you had this thing where if, if you, when, when, when voicemail, remember the, I don't know if many people would remember this, but so you'd have an answering machine in your house that was this old answering machine. And when somebody called, you could hear their outgoing message and their voice and determine whether you wanted to pick up the phone or not. Absolutely. Yeah. And your outgoing answering machine <laughs> was unbelievable, like nobody else's. And I'd love you to recreate it because you, you talked about how, you know, hi, this is Orny Adams. If you need to reach me, you can call my cell at this number. My fax is this number. My email is this number. It would go on forever, like every way possible. It would, if Sounds you, if, pretty desperate. If you if you if you have a fire in your backyard, I respond yeah. to three puffs of smoke. <laughs> it was I, an incredible. Was answer. it? Yeah, yeah. You remember that? I don't. I have no recollection at all. Really? Yeah. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. So like right in the beginning, when I knew you, you were like an entrepreneurial kind of comedian from the very beginning you you wanted to figure out every single way where you could people could find you and know about you even before there were really ways to do that and i thought that was really really interesting about huh. you yeah I, I love the business i still love the business i love deals I do all my own deals, and I love it. And you I know, know that. I know that. You've negotiated with me. You know I've what it's ne like. I've negotiated with you. For those of you who don't know, uh, you know, Orny has had uh, great managers and great agents, and uh, and uh, at this time, he just decided, like, uh, uh, Lamar, uh, Lamar Jackson, okay. that he would be his own uh, agent and manager, and he does his own deals. Lamar Jackson from the Baltimore Ravens did this $240 million it's deal great. or whatever it is. It's great. I love it. I love it. He didn't want to give up the, I think those agents make like 4% or 6 but I can't remember what they make. It's not even giving up a percentage. It's the, I, I enjoy the deals. I love, I love numbers. I love figuring out the numbers. Do you numbers. feel like you're a better negotiator than uh, a manager or an agent? Well, I don't know because... A manager or an agent, which you've been, is partly negotiating for themselves. So part of it is how much time will I put into this deal for it to work for X amount of extra money? So I'll keep squeezing because it's in my best interest 100%. But a manager or an agent will say, well, if I can get a few more thousand dollars, it's only a couple hundred dollars more to me. I'm just going to close it. I'm going to close four deals with this buyer at this time. I just keep going. And I have... Since working by myself and with an assistant, I've gotten the best deals I've ever gotten in my life. Got to see you made more money without an agent or manager than you have with one. Absolutely. Now, one of the things... That was and that's not a rub on them at all. No, one of the things that was fascinating about talking to you, uh, I, you know, I have no problem talking about this. Hopefully you, you know. So I love Orny and I, I've... You know, I've expressed my interest in representing him on more than one occasion. And one of the things he shared with me that fascinated me, he said, I uh, said, how many auditions have you been on in the past year or two or whatever? And he said, none. 
And every month I would send him a different audition that I had gotten for him and be like, ah, it's okay, you know, it's uh, whatever. In the span of just not representing you, yeah. I sent you like seven <laughs> auditions. Yeah. But you didn't want to go on, in on them because you thought to yourself, if I go in and I'm Barry's going to think, hey, you see, what happens if I get it? I'll have to like, be holding to this. No, no if, if, if I got it, you would take your percentage. But you didn't even want to go. Uh, I, I think you made it feel like you would be representing me across the board. If, if you or uh, anybody, I, I write that if anybody the... wants to send me an audition, wants to send me a project, feel free to take the percentage. That's the way I feel. It's like when I bought my house, uh, I would work with a real estate agent and the real estate agent would say, we're working exclusively, right? And I say, no, I'm, I'm not. They go, well, I only work with people exclusively. I said, okay, then don't send me houses. And I had five people sending me house and every house, I would always see the listing before they did. Now with my house that I bought, this one guy came to me and said, my best friend is selling his house, doesn't want to put it on the market. He wants this much. If you want to give it to him, you, you can get it. And we drove up and I bought the house. So no negotiation. Uh, I negotiated for, I have a trailer in my backyard where I shoot my podcast as a Shasta trailer, 1963 Shasta trailer. And I said, that's included, right? And they said, no. And I said, I'm only taking the house. And then I, I backed it out of the offer for the house and gave them cash for it. I know, I, I know what I'm doing, <laughs> but it's like that. If anybody wants to bring me anything and you'll be happy to know I have, Great voiceover agents right now that send me several auditions a week, and I do them from home. Are they exclusive? Yes. Yes. I can't believe it. Why did you go exclusive? Because they were highly recommended. They're a big agency, and uh, I was talking to them, and I was recommended from a very big client of theirs. And the, the, the woman, the, the head of the agency called me, and it started to feel like a courtesy call. You know, it started to feel like, hey, well, listen, here's the deal. I just came over from this studio. I've only been here a few months. Our roster's too fat. We're going to be cutting the roster a little bit. This isn't a great time. I said, let me stop you there. <laughs> I said, here's the good news. I don't need the money. I've done really well with stand-up comedy. I just want to try this out. So if anything seems right for me, send it to me. If I book it. Great. I said, you'll never hear from me. Well, yeah. I'll never ask for a follow-up. I'll never say, hey, how come I'm not getting auditions? You'll never hear from me. And it's great. They send me an email. You've been invited to audition for this. I go to my portal. There's a client portal. I click on it. I see the sides. I go into my little studio. I do it. I send it off. And that's it. And I either book it or I don't. How many auditions have you done so far? A lot. A lot. I've what's, been, it's what's, been, your, what's your ratio? Uh, I haven't booked a single thing. <laughs> Here's the thing. I, I was, and this is what I think is fascinating about this town. I know people that are represented by this agency. And I've talked with these. These are friends. And nobody has brought me to them. And they know, they know I want to do voiceovers. In fact, I, I have a, a neighbor that's a big director for, uh, for, for animated films. And I would never ask. But if I was presented via an agent, it would make a nice connection. And uh, I was at the gym one day. And I was waiting for a piece of equipment and somebody else was, uh, didn't know I was waiting and went on it when the other person just got up. And I said, and I said, um, you ever say something in your head? Like, like, Hey man, I was, I was waiting for that. You know what I mean? But it comes out as you're an asshole. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. like, Hey man, I was waiting for that. Like I just, and I startled him a little bit and he goes, Oh no, no worries. Don't worry about it. And, uh, and he said, uh, how's your standup going? Oh shit. The guy knows me. Damn it. So I said, it's going, it's going great. I said, why don't, you, why don't you work out with me? And he said, how I know you. And he ended up connecting me with his agents. And very few people in this town do that. And I don't understand why it is. In fact, well, I, I'll tell you why I, it is, Arnie. It's because you have to be an asshole to somebody first. Yeah, I guess and so. And then you win them over back and I, then it happens. I guess so. But I mean, like I've, I've gone in for auditions for things and I've said, you know what? This, this person's right for this, not me. And I've recommended somebody. In fact, I know somebody got a part that I recommended them for. I've never said anything. Did they give you a taste? Never even told them. Why tell them? Why In tell information them? Information is power. I got to tell the audience a story about okay. your house. Have you seen my house? No, I haven't seen Are you the house. one flying the drone over? <laughs> <laughs> no, I haven't seen your house, but this is a great story. Yeah. 
So I'm driving through from meeting the meeting in Los Angeles. And when I'm driving in Midtown, there's a Starbucks that's no longer there that I love to go to. It was, um, I forget what you call it, but it's a, it's like the four seasons of Starbucks. There's like one in every city. And this yeah, was it's, a, it's out of business now. It's out of business, but it was like a, you know, like marble everywhere. It was like an insane place. And, in, I, yeah. and I always used to like to stop there and I had my little spot that I could set up in, in between meetings. And I'm coming out of my car and I see Orny uh, walking around the corner. And I'm like, what's, what's up, Orny? How you doing? He says, ah, what an interesting day. Can't believe I ran into you. I said, well, why? What happened? Today's the day I'm moving. I'm moving out of my apartment and I'm moving into my new house. And, you know, there was something that I saw in my house that I realized that it's time to get rid of it. I'm like, what's that? He said, uh, I'll, I'll let you know in a little bit. I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm going in here. He said, you, you, uh, you'll find out. Don't worry. I'll, I'll let you know. And I go back into the Starbucks. I say goodbye to you. And I come out uh, after finishing my stuff and going to my next meeting. And I go to my car, to the driver's side window, and taped onto my window with clear uh, yeah, moving tape. Moving tape, sure. Is my action figure yeah. from the movie Comedian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was leaving it all behind. It was one of my greatest moments. I was in that apartment for so many years. And I shot three of my specials out of that apartment. Uh, I got deal after deal. And I said, it's time for me to just shed. And I left almost everything behind. I gave almost everything away to Goodwill. And I, and I started over. And it was, uh, you know, that move was amazing. And then to come out and see you the day I'm moving was just like bizarre. It was like, oh, this is just so meant to be. I'm supposed, so meant to be out of this place. And I've never been happier. It, uh, and you're like, I'm so meant to be out of this place. And no matter where I go i have to see this guy there he is yeah yeah Jesus, i just know it. there's no escape no yeah. matter whether i move or not yeah well, what, to... and, and uh let me fin let me finish the story of the voice because i didn't what happened was when i said that i said you'll never hear from me she said hey, she goes hang on let me this would work and she said let me set up a, a conference call with everybody in the agency and i was on with about 12 different agents and i said the same thing i said listen my i don't do voices characters i don't do accents i do this I can be louder, softer, angrier, whatever, some emotion, but this is my range. Send me stuff. And it's been a great working relationship. I haven't booked anything, but it's a great working relationship. And that, that I like. You know what's fascinating? You, of all people, I wouldn't expect <laughs> to say, hey, listen, I'm getting tons of auditions. I haven't booked anything. I'm spending hours and hours of my time. Not one penny has gone into my pocket. Not one penny has gone into their pocket. Fucking great relationship. It's great. If well, you had a manager or an agent that didn't get you any money, you'd be like, this is the shittiest relationship ever. I'm getting out of this relationship. Because I will conquer it. I will succeed. And I have a podcast now. I make a little bit of money. But someday it will make me a lot of money. Because I'll learn ways to monetize it that we haven't even figured out yet. I'll, I'll give you an example. When I did my first um, CD, Path of Most Resistance, shot at the, the Ice House, and we used four or five different cameras that didn't even match. There was no budget. And me and one guy, Eric Stoltz, a sound guy who I'm, I still work with to this day, we put this thing together. And I was going to sell it after my shows for $15. Let's say I sold 10 of them. $150, like that felt like a good amount of money. And now that CD is played all over the world, streaming on Sirius, on Spotify, you know, everywhere. And it's made me so much money. And I have three albums like that, but I didn't know at the time. The $923 every three months that give me that kind of money? Oh no, like real money. Okay. Just yeah, real it. money. Right. And you know, uh, it's it's amazing. I'll, I'll knock on wood if there's wood because I just feel so grateful. But that's that's what I believe, and I believe that once I click with the voiceover, it will. And if if not, I failed on my own terms, and that's something that people don't realize is really important in life and in this business. You've got to be willing to fail. You know, buddy guy gets up on stage and starts playing. He doesn't. There's no game plan, and he says sometimes I just fail, and he accepts that. 
And it's okay to do that. You don't, uh, you don't have to kill every time. And the fact that I would come out and say that, yeah, 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 but I haven't booked anything. Now, if I had reps, I used to have reps and I would, I would uh, post pictures of uh, the empty show, the empty second late show Friday. It's empty. And I get a call. What are you doing? Take that down. Buyers are going to see that. I'm like, people know. Like, why can't we be honest and say, yeah, I'm not selling out. Like, here, here's the thing. You'll, you'll go to some of these markets and, and it won't be sold out. And they'll, oh, it's always sold out. I don't know what happened. The garlic, the garlic festival's in town. And then you call five of your friends that you saw on the calendar in the last few months at that venue. Same story. So I don't know why we're, we're hiding it. And, you know, I'm at a point in my career right now where, you know, we're adding shows next week in Florida. I just sold out Chicago. That's a club that's, you know, huge. Sold it out ahead of time. Um, not every show, but, you know, not the late show Friday again. Same with, with uh, Irvine. I'm already I'm booked for Irvine before I even do that the week that you know I was there in December 2023 before that week they called to book me for December 20 so you know it's okay to talk about these things in a realistic way you know what I mean and it's good for young comics to understand that well let's let's talk about that for a second cuz I just want to show you the other side <clears throat> Do you watch any sports at all? Yeah, of course. Okay. Remember when we were growing up, we'd, you know, watch or we'd go to Fenway Park and it would always be sold out. This is the 967th sellout of Fenway Park. Or you'd watch a baseball game from there on television, packed. And then you'd see a baseball game with the Florida Marlins and there'd be like, you know, the whole place would be empty and you could tell how they were trying to get the cameras down low and yeah. doing whatever. But what did you feel when you watched the Marlins game? What was your emotion when you felt, when you see a, a stadium that's half empty? No, not about comedy, just your emotion when you watch that versus watching Fenway Park sold out. Uh, what do you feel? I feel like they're not doing well. And it, it's a bad, it's a bad franchise. It's a bad team mm -hmm. and people don't want to support the team. Right. So when an artist puts out a video that their show is half full and then another artist puts one out there where it's full, my, my brain goes to they're doing well, things are going great. Um, the club's doing great when they're there. And this person isn't doing that well. That's where my brain goes, just like it does in sports. And that's why your agents told you that. Oh, I get it. But that's not the way I operate. I know. Yeah, I get I get it from a business perspective. But the, you can't disagree if with you me know, about the well, baseball. I don't disagree at all. I don't disagree that it's bad for business. But, but you're a businessman. I am a businessman, but I'm also an honest businessman. I'm also a guy that... Get information, never give it. Well, I mean, like, I believe in fair business and I believe I don't believe in misguiding people or misrepresenting. And I don't mind if I'm going to sit there and, you know, we know my reputation. We know that. I'm, what is your reputation? Uh, you tell me. No, you tell me. I just I was leading you into it. <laughs> no, I want to know what you think your reputation is. I think that um, people believe that I'm confident in what I do. That's your reputation? I believe that's it. I think okay. that's it exactly. Yeah. Okay. I don't think this. You seem skeptical of that. Uh, no. Yeah. No, I, I. that's definitely true. People believe you're confident. I believe people know that I'm honest. And I think if you look at any project I've done or any interaction, I, I could have played this game completely different. And when I say I could have, biologically, it's impossible for me. It's, it's impossible for me to go on a red carpet and pretend it just, that isn't who I am. And so it isn't true to me if I don't vent and say, hey, this show, th this show is not, uh, listen, I saw Buddy Guy. I saw him in New Orleans. I, I saw him in New Orleans at the Jazz Festival. This is a guy that um, Jimi Hendrix credits for him playing the guitar behind his back and, and for changing him. But uh, Eric Clapton says he's the greatest living guitarist. Keith Richards, the same thing. And this is a guy who's playing to half sold out venues. Okay. He's the guy who influenced everybody. I don't think any, I don't think any less of him. I think this is tragic. 
And there's, I, I think, you just I said, want people you just to know. Said you think it's tragic. I think it's absolutely tragic. Time out. And there's a sense of injustice. Time out. When you, when you associate a person's name with the word tragic, does that sound good? Listen, it isn't good. And the universe is to blame. Meaning it's tragic that he is not selling out. And, and rather than pretending it's full, I'd rather everybody see that it's not full and, 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 and the, tr the injustice, and then maybe it corrects itself. That's, that's the way I feel. I, I just, I don't know. There's, you, you see it differently. You're, you're a business no, guy. I'm a business no, guy. I, I, Orny, Orny, you, you, if you look at your bank account, if you look at the money that you made in the past decade, you're like in the top 2% of the world in terms of earning money. That's a highly successful businessman. So I don't question anything about your, what's fascinating about you is that you're highly successful doing things the way you do them. And because I believe that, I've always believed that in my heart that, and I, I, I can't even tell you the amount of times I've told you that I think you're one of the most extraordinary wordsmiths and um, phraseologists and, and the way you <clears throat> wax the poetry and the emotions and the uh, diction and the alliteration one of the greatest of, of, of doing that it's it's uh it's and your voice highly original like it's incredible like i look at somebody like and i i know you know you're saying barry calm down but i'm not saying you're this person because maybe it'll be a few years before you're judged with this person but you know part of norm mcdonald's charm was that voice that voice that was so bizarre and different and the premises, the premises that came from nowhere and you were just wondering, where is this going to go? It's like, yeah, you know, the guy, you know, the devil told him to kill his whole family. And uh, imagine what that looked like. You know, you, you got your family in a duffel bag and the guy goes, hey, it's Bob, <laughs> Bob, your friend Bob. Oh, you got me there, Bob. I got the, I got my family in a duffel bag here, you know, and, and those kind of concepts are like, you can't, you know, you're taught, you're, you're listening to a guy talk about dismembering his family, <laughs> the devil, but that voice and the way he performed it, you forgot all about it. And you have a way of performing comedy in a way that makes people forget about almost how dark sometimes some of the messages are because it's like a performance. And also the way you perform is highly original from most any other performer that I've ever seen perform, except for maybe Charlie Barnett, the late Charlie Barnett, who performed sometimes just with the mic, he just put the mic on the stand in front and he'd just be, right, he wouldn't even use the mic. Yeah. You use the mic, but not use the mic, and it 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 makes the audience have to pay attention. You're like a preacher on steroids to the thousand percent <laughs> because they can hear it. They have to go. They not hear it. Whatever it's it's in the air. What did he say? It's like let's listen more intently, and it's like a sermon, but it's about today's culture and today's life and what it's like to deal with the problems of society and what society gives you. And so I've always said that you're one of the, to me, like you're one of the greatest comedians out there today. There's no, no question in my mind. You know, I don't care. I always think about this, like, for instance, uh, and this is where I'm going with this and you'll get ready to kill me. Andy Dick is one of the greatest comedic actors of my time. I mean, that guy, the red light goes on and it's like, it's just magic every time. There's never a time when the red light goes on in an <laughs> acting job where the guy doesn't kill. Mm -hmm. 
But sometimes, you know, what happens is that the industry sees you a certain way or they they grab a hold of different ways of how you are. And uh-huh. it's not just you. It's like, you know, I mean, Louis C.K. Can't, can't get a television and film job. I mean, it's been, what, 10, 8 years, 10 years. Kevin Spacey. The guy hasn't worked. He got, he was, he, he was exonerated. You know what I mean? So, so. But you're putting me in a category. These people have been canceled for this you, or I'm that. putting yeah. you in the category of two guys who are brilliant. Louis C.K., Kevin Spacey, Arnie Adams. For you, you don't have controversy like that. You yeah, have let's the, be clear about that. <laughs> I, I think I'm very <laughs> clear about that. But you have like a brewing, you always have this brooding thing this you're like remember in uh the peanuts cartoons pig pen you always had that yeah. cloud of dirt coming and it's like there's this thing because you're so brilliant so incredible yet there's something of how like you said it when you were at the gym and i'm glad you said it because it was like i think that's the thing that sometimes in that case it didn't get you in trouble it, it actually helped you tremendously but I, I think maybe in your career, maybe there's been times where it's just, um, you know how a text doesn't reflect tone? Yeah, yeah. And I think sometimes I look at you as like text, you know, like you, you'll you say things sometimes or act a certain way, and it's like if it were text, I'd be like, whatever. And even in person, it might feel like that. So people don't know how to understand you and take you. And then when you kill and you're so highly successful, and your act is so highly original, it's very hard for people to figure out how to uh, create a stir around you dramatically, yeah. because your, your act speaks for itself. It's like, it's like, and then at the improv, when you're in town, every f-ing night you're down there closing off that show or doing whatever, and they're like, God, this is the, the fucking hardest working guy and this guy never fucking stops it's like a it's mm. like a tail in new york at the cellar he just comes or kinnis or kinnison or yeah. dice at the the store yeah. they used to go and so you have this incredible work ethic but i feel like you've overcome so much and i, I often wonder i don't know the answer i don't know the answer if you'd be more extraordinary and more, um, you know, of a household name and more of a successful person. You're already so successful. I met with the, I had an interview. I want to share this with you. And I know I'm rambling, but I think No, and and, and I I just want to say that I love that analogy. I love the texting. And I think there's probably truth to that. And I think that's uh, really a smart way you put it. And uh, uh, I I like that. And 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 I get that. And I accept that. And I think that, um, yeah, but I also like being misunderstood. I think there's something interesting to that. And when I was a kid, I was a kid that got A's, but pissed off the teachers. And they hated the fact that, you know, mathematically, you know, they have to give me that A. But I was a wise ass. And, you know, it sort of has continued on in life. But I, I, I just want you to so, say, I like that astute observation. Well, that's, uh, as if, I can, if I can do something that can make you take notice, then I'm really flattered. That's, uh, well, no, no, yeah, I mean, but at the, and then at the end you say, well, I haven't, uh, I haven't figured it out. I'm like, shit, I thought after all that you had figured it out. I thought you figured out the, the code. And, and no, maybe I, it, I, it no, can't be figured no, out. No, I, I, well, the code is patterns. The code is all always about the patterns of your life, and you just said it, which was fascinating. I was in grade school or whatever, I got AIDS, but my teachers hated me, but they had to give me the A's. Hello? Uh, the comedians don't really embrace me as much as I want them to, but I'm fucking killing. I'm making shit loads of money. I'm getting booked back at the improv over and over again. Are you? Maybe not. I am. Well, you know, the comedians... uh, But what I'm saying is it's like the fraternity of the school teachers is the fraternity of the comedians. And so... 
you can get straight A's. Yeah, and, but I don't know if it works in that sense because I don't go out and try and piss off the comedians. But I, I, I will notice Did you that, try to piss off the teachers? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, 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 um, I knew what I could get away with and still get A's. And, uh, but with comedy, you know, the truth is, and if we're, you know, this is a show where I assume young people listen to this and, and try and get some yeah, they're gonna, knowledge. They're going to learn a lot from you. Yeah. I, I have said publicly that probably one of the biggest mistakes I made starting in New York City was, um, you could say, part aloof, part uh, socially just awkward. But I would go into a club, hammer it out on stage, and then I'd leave. I'd go home and sit there with my notes every single night listening to music and smoking a cigar, maybe having a drink. Sometimes I'd go to, I used to go to this jazz and blues club and I'd sit there alone and smoke a cigar until late at night, until four in the morning, then go to a diner and eat alone. And I was a very alone person, but I loved it. I loved taking, to this day, I still love it. I loved taking a, a line and taking out a syllable, like what Bob Dylan does, or, or adding two words together and getting it perfect. I love just cranking it and cranking it. And so I would go into these clubs, and I, I guess I'm competitive. I probably, if I were to give advice to a young comic, I always say ingratiate yourself to the community, which I didn't do, and go up to some. So last night, I was at the Laugh Factory, <clears throat> and I'll, I'll say who it is off the air, but I won't hear. There was a comic that is successful. I've never, I don't think I've ever worked with him or had interaction with him. And I thought he was doing great on stage. And I went out of my way to find him and tell him that and just look him in the eyes and just say, hey, that was, that was really great. And I saw it turn in his face. He's like, oh man, I, I just saw you too. Cause I, this was after my set. He goes, that, that was great. That was, and I never did that. And I think that really, really hurt me. And that's one of my biggest regrets. How many people do you see now in comedy that blow you away? That like you watch them and you're like, holy mm. shit, there's something really mm. special happening there. Mm. Zero? Okay. How many people are out there in comedy that you really like what they do and you understand how they create their formula and how they do it, but you really, really, when you watch them, you're like, okay, I give you my props on that. You didn't, you're not blowing me out of the water. You're not <laughs> like, but there's something, there's at least something special happening here. Yeah, I think that, uh, I, I, I see that in a lot of comics. I can see you know, I certainly see a lot of moments and I see some great and I'm torn because I have a, a, a moral philosophy about comedy. And um, but I also get that it's about making the audience laugh and you can't argue with somebody that's selling a ton of tickets. People want to see that comic. And I can't I can't disagree with that on that level, but it's not. It's not my brand or what I do. Um, I, 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 don't know, I, I don't know how to answer that question about who blows me away and blows me away. I, I don't know. I don't watch much comedy. Uh, and again, that's you ask most oh. comics, I'll say that. But uh, when I'm in a club and I see somebody for a few minutes, I'll say, yeah, that's, I, that's cool. I, I, I like that. But yeah. I, I, I don't know what it is. And I guess it's an evolution or whatever. I... I've become such a huge fan of the premise that I've never really heard before and the lines after it that totally surprise me of where they're going. And don't get me wrong, not everybody's a superstar that has these lines. Like I was watching this comedian, I think his name's Jay Mandian. And he had this incredible line where it's like, uh, you know, because he, he's Indian. He says, I'm going to fuck it up. But he says, you know, growing up, you know, you 
you never, you know, you never see anybody who's Indian unless, you know, somebody won the lottery and, <laughs> uh, and they would go interview the store owner right, who right, sold right. them the ticket. And like, cause I wasn't expecting him to say the store owner. Yeah, I was yeah. expecting him to say the person who won the lottery. And so there's those moments which are so great about you where it's like, I don't, I have no f***ing idea where it's going. However, you have some bits that I love, and this is another thing I love, that break the rules, and this is what I like about certain comics too, who take the risk of doing a routine where they pen and tell her the joke. They... You know exactly where they're going with the joke, and they still f crush with it, giving <laughs> you exactly what you're they're telling you they're gonna do. An example of this would be I mean, it's probably too simple a bit, but it's like let's take a Boston person like Bill Burr. I'm gonna f this up probably as well, but you know, you put the word mother before something or after something, and it means two different things, right. You know, the, you know, you know, mother Asian person, that Asian mother -fucker. Yeah, yeah. And he tells you exactly what. But it's a smart observation. But I'm just saying, but you, you, he, he tells you, this is the magic trick. I'm just going to tell you before I say it. And then he says it. But what makes that work is his examples are so extraordinary and work so well that it's, it's what I love in comedy which I've done, and uh, you point to right field, and then you knock it out of the park into right field. You point at the, the actual fan in the bleachers that you're going to, it's going right to you, buddy. It's going right in your glove, and you do it. And that's somebody that has constructed a great bit. And there's nothing better than a great bit. And I always say, what makes a great comedian? They've got a signature bit. So you take like a Chris Rock. Okay, he's got that to bit. To me, that nine minutes black people versus the N-word, that's the one that I love. The, it's I, nine, nine and a half minutes long. It's like, it's just, that's the premise. There's black people and then there's N-words. And now I'm going to show you the difference. Right, so that's the exact through. same premise. Which you know, one were you thinking of? I, I like when he said, uh, <laughs> in every city, there's two malls. <laughs> the malls the uh, white people go to and the mall the white people used to go to. And that's genius. Just the word used to. Used to go to. It's genius. Because you know, the minute there's two malls, you know what he's saying. You know where he's going to go. But the way he phrased it, it's one of the greatest lines. You know? Just added used to. Yeah. That's it. And I may have butchered it a little bit, but that's the essence of it. And, you know, oftentimes, like Gary Shandling, I hear lines. In fact, today, I was talking to my parents because I'm, I'm signing my will. And You're signing your will. Yeah, I'm doing my will. I'm crying. Yeah. This is so. This is so. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, You're doing your will. Your parents aren't your parents the ones supposed to do the will? Yeah, but you gotta have a, you gotta have a will. You Why know? now are you doing the will? Because you know you have to. You get to a certain age, you have assets. One of my favorite comedians who passed away, this guy Bob Lazarus in Boston, he used to have this great line. He said. He said, I'm so poor, I won't have a will. I'll have a won't. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, you got a will. I can't believe it already. You yeah, know. this is my second will. What are you, like 53? You got a will? Well, I change, every time I go home, I change you got it. got a second will? What you yeah, because I go home and then somebody irritates me. You got to take me out of it again? Yeah, take it out, yeah. I go home and I picture like the whole family sitting at the table with piles of cash <laughs> in front of each person. And then somebody says something to upset me. I just take a pile and I move a little bit over there. Do they know who's been cut out? No, they don't know. I call my lawyer. He goes, I go, I've been home. I go, St. Jude's is getting more money. <laughs> How do you change your will without it f***ing up and getting the original one? Because I've allocated lumps of sums to money to nieces, nephews. And I don't want to say too much because I'll get knocked off. Someone in the family will, will take me out for the will. But so we, they said, did you sign a do not resuscitate? Ah, and the, and the, the, why don't you tell people what that is? Do, that's the DNR, meaning if you're on oxygen and how long do you want to be left on the feeding tubes and all that sort of stuff. And Shanley had a great line. And I don't know if he ever did it on stage, but he said, uh, uh, my DNR is uh, uh, do not resuscitate 
as long as CNN is covering it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just such a perfect Shanley. You know, Shanley had so many great lines like that that were just so him. Like, if I get another email <laughs> for penal enlargement, I'll go broke. Like, it's just perfect writing. So when I see, like, a joke that is so true to who that person is, it just, you know... Yeah, uh, uh, oh. Carlin. How come for us? How, how come for us? It's a how come for uh, us? It's an abortion, but for a hen, it's an omelet. Huh? Huh? You know, like whatever. Like they're just great. And th those moments, like if anybody's watching wants to know one of the greatest bits of all time, it's Alan King, uh, survived by my wife. And there's a, it's an eight minute clip, and it builds. And the cadence gets faster and faster, and he gets louder and bigger. And you just, you every example, you he can't get better. It can't get better, and it just keeps getting better. And that's somebody that probably did that bit. And this is where I get frustrated with where comedy is now, where it's all about how much are you producing. When I see you next year, uh, will you do the same material? Will there be some of the new jokes? These guys used to really work bits for years and perfect them. And now it's sort of like, I'm just going to throw out a premise and have a reaction, and then that's the end of George it. George Carlin did baseball and football on the first episode of SNL in the monologue. And then in 1990, on an HBO special, he rewrote it and did a longer version. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have bits that uh, I've been working on, and I add new lines all the time. I wish I brought my notes. I would show you how I do it. And when you, like, sometimes... Like I'll have a premise and I'll go, this is, this is a, a B plus. And then I find one line, I go, just became an A joke. It's now finished. How do you find the line? Finds me. How does it find you? Just, I spend all day with, with my thoughts. And so it's I, like a puzzle. It's like fine trying to find that piece of the puzzle. But I, I don't try and find it, 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 it. I'm not, it, it comes to me. Always. Or I get rid of it. But it, it it does. Like, I don't sit down and say, I'm going to write today. But I can sit down and put 10 note cards with topics, subjects, and, and, and stare at it for an hour and then have it in my head all day. And then just write the line. And I tell everybody, the minute you, the second you get that line, I don't care where, if you're driving, pull over and put it in your notes. Because it will never be as concise and laconic and perfect as the first time you thought of it. Because later when you try and write it again, you'll add words You'll start to think, well, do they have enough information? Like, you know, you start to compensate. Hey, everybody, it's Barry Katz, and I wanted to talk to you about Blueprint for Success. This is a community that I put together during the pandemic to help all artists of every walk of life in the entertainment business, no matter where you are in that part of this journey. It's designed to help you. There are podcasts with people that will inspire you, like Kevin Hart, Judd Apatow, Bill Burr, that you can't find anywhere else but on this program that I've interviewed, to times where we get to talk to executives in the business that you would never have access to, to tell you what you need to hear and to answer your questions to all sorts of different videos and master classes designed to help you get to the promised land. That's what the blueprint for success is. Doesn't matter whether you want to be a stand-up comedian, a sketch performer, a podcaster, an actor, an actress, director, writer, social media person, whatever you want to be. I've been doing this for 40 years. I've had the honor and been humbled to represent people like Chappelle, Wanda Sykes, Louis C.K., Dane Cook, and probably over 20 other people who went from a studio apartment to being a multimillionaire and a household name. And I want that for you. And I wanted to take the time with this program to be able to help you on your way there, to get there and to heighten and increase the trajectory of your career. Blueprint for success is the way to go. I'm proud to be a part of this program, and I'd be proud to have you to be a part of it too. Everybody writes different. You know, Chappelle used to live in my building in New York. I used to go up to his place, and we used to hang out. Neil Brennan, 
We talk about writing, and I would write out every. If you look at my routines, they're all they're all written out. It could be five pages, and by the time it's done, it's three lines on stage. But I write every thought out, and every alternate line, and what line works, and all that. And Chappelle just would write, you know, English muffin on a piece of paper, and then he would riff on it. I just, don't even think he wrote English muffin on a piece of paper. <laughs> I don't think he wrote anything on a piece of yeah, paper. Yeah, you worked with him, so you might know better than I, me. I don't ever remember seeing him write, uh, maybe I did write some, he wrote some bullet points, but I used to put his sets, uh, and I still do it for comedians, into segments. You know, whatever it was, it was a five minute set, I I put it into these segments so he could remember the segments, and so he could rehearse the segments on stage or what it was, no matter if it was an, even Dane Cook and that and two hour special, I, there were segments. Which special? Just uh, almost all of them, there were yeah. segments. And, and the one time that I remember something that was fascinating about his specials, which I don't know if this is common knowledge or not, uh, when he did the the uh, Vicious Circle special, he was he had just come off this movie and he didn't have a chance to rehearse the special because wow. he got the he got the movie and he wasn't going to turn down the movie and he had these the dates all set up at Boston Garden and so I mean he did a few sets here and there but nothing really and he said to me, listen, uh, we're going to go over what I want to do. We're going to name each bid. And, um, and I want to be spontaneous. And so what I did was I put all the bits on a computer screen in columns. I think there were three different columns that would fit on a, um, like a laptop screen mm. or a monitor. Yeah. No, no line in between, just words or whatever. And I would be in back on this teleprompter. Wow. And. And he wanted to be spontaneous. So every time he would do a bit, I erased it from the screen. Wow. And so he would know which bits he hadn't done. Fascinating. Yet. Huh. And that's how that special was uh, put together. Wow. Very, very strange. I, I have a question for you. And this, maybe this is, is a it, question. Is this for the trailer in your backyard? Or no, 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 no. I'm, I'm really, I'm really curious. And maybe it's a question that you can edit this out if, if, it, if it makes you uncomfortable. I haven't signed my own release yet. So. Okay. Okay. I mean, you, you've worked with like Chappelle and. Yes. You've worked with Dane. You've yes. worked with some some of the some of the best. Bill Burr. I worked with a, a little bit. I worked with Mike Epps. I worked with Louis Anderson. I worked with. But all like different... Chappelle and Dane were guys that you worked with really early on. Yes, I worked with Louis. I worked with a lot of people early on, really well, early on. So Wanda Sykes, um, Nick Swartz, and I worked with a lot of young people. But like a Chappelle. Yes. And a, a Dane, who I felt like you had a friendship with, and probably you know, I think you still do. Yeah. What is it like to lose a client like that? Oh, it's, um, you know, life is about uh, loss. You know, as sooner you realize that your life, your journey is, is always going to be a loss. You know, you, you can't avoid it. So it's like, no matter how great you are as a person, personally, no matter how great a husband you are or a boyfriend or how great a family member you are, a business person, or even if you're Herb from accounting. And Herb. So I, I love, I just want you to know that this is a, a really emotional question, but not for the reasons you think it is. Um, my dad died when I was four and I saw how my mother dealt with loss. I saw her cry every night mm -hmm. and I, at four years old, trying to console her and trying to make things okay. Mm -hmm. And so I, at an early age, I, I was prepared, prepared for loss, but I also knew that, you know, the world has a plan and you move forward. And, and like when I, uh, stopped working with Chappelle, um, you know, it was, it was, it was bone crushing, you know, eight years, nine years. And I love working with him. Just incredible. I still, you know, thank God he's still friendly me to me this mm -hmm. day. He's, he's invited me to shows and you know, my sons to shows. And, um, but then he goes away and then, 
And then, you know, somebody like Dane Cook comes into your life and mm -hmm. then you concentrate on Dane Cook and you concentrate because, you know, just like, you know, you're a great comedian. Look, I, I don't know if there was a hundred comedians and people in the industry from all over the country, but if somebody were going to sit around and all those hundred people were going to say it was a shitty manager, that would shock me. You know, it's like, I, I, I've done it over and over and over but again. But isn't, isn't part of it keeping clients like that? And I'm not, I'm not trying to make you feel bad or grill you at all, no. but, but even when you're you, not, you're your, not, your verbiage is when we stop working together, did you stop working together? Did Chappelle leave you? Like, well, there's certain people that I, there's certain people that I stopped working with that obviously I'm an idiot. Uh, Bill Burr was one of them. Um, and there's certain people like Chappelle who stopped working with me. And why would you stop working with Burr? What was, I just felt like I was, I just felt like I wasn't the best manager for him. I mean, I worked with him for like, I think seven or eight years and, you know, he booked a television series early on, but I felt like I, I wasn't inspiring enough or I wasn't doing enough to help him get past what he yeah. needed to get past to become the star that I, I hoped that he would be. And I just, I don't want to be same with Mike Epps. I resigned from working with Mike Epps and oh. I just didn't feel like I was the, like, I'm not going to, I'd rather not make money and, and help somebody get to the next level. Cause there's always going to be somebody who I can help and, and do well with. And the goal is to have, you know, when you're the dry cleaner, the goal is to have Orny Adams as a client, you know, for his whole life. But then, the, you know, sometimes you leave and you go to another dry cleaner. Yeah. I always wonder what it must be like as a manager, because I have a, I have a friend that is an agent at a huge agency and he discovered somebody really young in another country, flew, flew him over, put him up and everything, and then lost him as a client, you know, 10 years later. And I always thought that must be devastating it's, devastating the thing is is like you gotta i tell everybody you gotta love the business don't fall in love with the business it's not there's no when you meet an artist it's like like you don't have this blood pack that you have to work together for the rest of your life if you do you do and if you don't you don't like but it, like, isn't that implied isn't that the the goal like when you get married you're married for life i think any All right, when I no, uh, but let's take that as an example because okay. like how, uh, you, many, how many marriages uh, last well they don't but that's the problem but like when you talk to me about repping me last year I think is this the guy that I want to rep me for the rest of my life I don't ever think this is something short term do you remember what I said to you I said you said we're going to do this for three weeks <laughs> no I, I said to you this I said I said if I don't do if I don't exceed all your expectations and do better than everybody else has done for you, fire my ass. And I've been fired when I've done extraordinary things. Yeah, I wouldn't want to enter into a... I'm just uh, saying, yeah. I'm just saying, like, yeah. I'm just saying, I want people to know that, like, if I'm not doing the job, then, you know, Dave Chappelle did seven, I think seven television deals in eight years, $400 million movies. He stopped working with me. It wasn't because I did a bad job. I mean, I, Tracy yeah. Morgan was on Saturday Night Live. What do you think your reputation is? What do you think well, your reputation is? I think is? my reputation is, I'll tell you, there's many reputations that I have. <laughs> and you didn't answer the question about you. So totally. So I'll answer the question about me. Number one, I'm not going to, I'm going to go in no particular order. Number one, he's a guy who had, and has one of the greatest eyes for talent in the comedy business. He's a guy who's seen over 25 different stand-up comedians who are living in a studio apartment who had nothing, who became multimillionaires. He's a guy who's gotten four people on Saturday Night Live and one person to host twice. He's a guy who started social media with a client, with a client and help build social media with a client. And now everybody has social media, Dane Cook. He's a guy who helped produce two albums that uh, were in the top five of the billboard chart, not the comedy billboard chart. He's a guy who's represented great people 
who have either fired him or he's left. And it's, it's undetermined why that is about what is he doing that's wrong, what's happening, why does that happen. But then after that happens, he seems to represent another person or more people who become multimillionaires. So he's capable of doing it over and over again, whether he takes the hit or not. He's a guy who um, likes to do too many things. He wants to produce boobies, wants to produce television. He does a podcast. No manager does a podcast. You know, what is he doing? Mm. I mean, he's, he's interviewing Orny Adams. He could be working for me. Why is he, why is he interviewing Orny Adams? I, he could be getting me a job. You know, so I take that risk. And I hope that my reputation is I try to be of service to comedians and I try to be a good person and try to help comedians. So I think that's all my reputation. But the one thing that people always probably rally upon are the things that are the fun things to get on is like that I have been fired multiple times and I've been hired multiple times. And I can, you know, I, I feel, and I don't know how you feel, I can take anybody, anybody who has a germ of talent, and I can make them a multimillionaire and a television and film star. I believe that in myself. Mm. I've done it over and over and over again. We still have that with fight their talent. You? Oh, I fucking love it. I love it. You know, I was on a call with uh, a team that shall be re remain nameless agents um, and television executives and lawyers. And I, when I work with a client, I put together like a, I don't know what you call it, like a state of their career. Like a like, manifesto? Yes. And it's like, has every single thing they're working on. It's like this particular one was like 12 pages long. It had every single thing. Mm. And I sent it to everybody and I get on the phone with the client and Two of the people on the phone said, before we get started, <laughs> I just want to ask you, Barry, uh, could you manage uh, all of our clients? Mm. Because we have never, ever gotten anything so organized and so succinct about an artist mm. in our entire careers here at the agency. But it's fun to talk about the things that don't go right. Just like it's fun to talk about the things in your career for artists that they feel is weird or awkward or doesn't go right or how orny is. Have you seen what orny did there or what he did that? So it's easy for people to say, huh, oh, fucking cats, he's doing it. What, what is he doing with this fucking podcast? I mean, what, yeah. what is he doing? What is he, what is, is he trying to make money? Is he trying to screw his scam? Yeah. Or is, you know, and, and it's the same thing with the management. Oh, the guy, the guy had Chappelle for eight years. He, got fired. Chappelle's the biggest star in the world. He had Burr for seven years. I represent, I just want to say this because I think this is fair. This, these are facts. Mm -hmm. Okay. You tell me if this is failure or success. I've represented one, I've represented uh, just, I'm just, I'll just mention 10 people without mentioning their names. Mention their names. Okay. I represented Tracy Morgan seven years. Okay. Wanda Sykes, six years. Louis C.K., seven years. Bill Burr, seven years. Dave Chappelle, eight years. Mm. Frank Caliendo, 10 years. Okay. Um, Dane Cook, 17 years. Jay Moore, 25 years. Wow. Is that failure? Honestly, is that failure? I think you've been very successful. Is and that, I, a, is I that do, a bad run? No, I think I, I think the one thing you said that is indisputable is that you have an eye for talent. And you get it. And when you flew to Vegas to see my shows and what you said, you know, it, it means it meant something to me. And I flew to Vegas to see your shows and the person who represented you didn't. <laughs> yeah. And I got him a ticket. Yeah. 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 Why did I fly to see your shows? Did I fly to see your shows because I had to be there? I, I genuinely, I genuinely think you love stand-up comedy and I, you understand stand-up comedy. And I went there because I wanted to help you 
in any way and support you to succeed. Yeah. Why don't you tell the audience how much money I probably made off that gig of you going there? Very little. Very little. In fact, you offered to waive the commission that's if I right. if that's I did subsequent uh, right. dates. In all fairness, people people should know that. Look right in the camera. People should know that. And why would I do that? I just what I said. I think you really are passionate about stand up comedy. You know what I care about? I care about having a meeting the other day with somebody who I interviewed long ago. I'm not going to mention their name. And they said, I just got a text the other day. I want to share it with you. I said, what's the text? He says, uh, it's a screenshot of me and you uh, doing a podcast together. And uh, the caption in the text read, I wanted more. I don't I get it. I said, who is the text from? He said, Judd Apatow. Oh. So that... Right, there's that, that that's, that's the currency that means something. That's to the me. currency. When Bill Burr calls me and says, I love that episode of you and Anthony Clark, I'm like, You're listening to episodes of mine. No, I'd like to listen Clark? to that. He said, Of course, I, I love, love the history. So, why am I doing it? I'm not, I'm doing it because now a rabbi would tell you that you do things 50% for yourself and 50% for others, but you know. If this does somehow, like you said, in, in, after I'm gone, you know, put some money in the Jewish Boy College Fund, mm -hmm. that's fantastic. But I spend the time because I know you have a lot to offer a lot of artists, and I think I have a lot to offer artists, and I can't manage everybody. I can't produce every television show or film that I'm working on or whatever. But I don't think necessarily like I'm in what you think I am because I, I get to work on so many different television projects. I get to work on, I just did a film with Michael Madsen and Rob Morrow and it was, and um, Zach Gordon from Diary of a Wimpy Kid. And it was, I produced the film and it was, it was fantastic. And so I, I get to do those things. I get to consult with, you know, big companies like Circus Soleil call me and say, listen, we're, we're, we want to do comedy for the first time in our career. Will you help us consult and figure out how we do it? And so, and I fight for you because I don't believe some of the people that they book are right for the show. I'm not a circus of legs, but I know comedy. <laughs> and when you went in there, you f***ing destroyed. And it was beautiful. So I, I think I know that I have a, 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 a clouded uh, past and future probably. I know a lot of people <laughs> say a lot of things about me, but I don't think I've ever walked in a room in a comedy club or any venue and had people repel away from me. They always, they always embrace me and I'm grateful for that. And, uh, you know, and so hopefully that's what people will see. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to be a good man. I want to do great things for people. I want to be a great manager too. I want to be a great producer too. Mm. I want to be a great consultant. I have this whole blueprint program that I do. People say, what the f*** are you doing? You know, you're doing this blueprint program for these, you know, young comedy artists. It's like, What is that? I have this program that I did from, I started in the pandemic, <laughs> which is they can subscribe for free. And I do a meeting every Monday night. Um, one will be an ask me anything. One will be a, a guest from the industry like like you. One will be um, where I break down a comedian's first television set who's a household name. Uh, and, you know, one will be a writer's room where we work on each other's bits. And it's there's like I, I launched about a year ago. There's like 650 people in the community that are there. And some pay extra money to get like a master class or some things that I recorded during the pandemic, or they get like a special meeting with me face to face or whatever. But why do I do these things? I don't, I don't know. I just, I will, I don't want to be one of those people who just does one thing and is, is, is selfish about doing, maybe it's selfish is the wrong word. I'm sorry. But is this, it's like, I don't like one of the things that I love about SD at the comedy cellar, She's one of the greatest. The, one of the greatest. No question. And the reason why she's one of the greatest 
in my humble opinion, is she made a choice, a, 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 an unselfish choice in a different way. She made a choice to do one thing and one thing well. And she stayed in that place and she's like the greatest for that whole organization, 35 years. And that's what makes her great. And I think what probably makes me, you know, what the, what's that whole thing that they say, uh, the master of none quote, I don't want to be like George Bush here, but, uh, <laughs> you know, fool me uh, once. No expert at, uh, whatever. If you do a lot of things, you're like a master of none. And I like doing a lot of different things. Like, I, were there, was there stuff that you did early on that, that you're paying for now, just like me? You know, I wasn't, uh, I didn't ingratiate myself to the scene. I, I didn't compliment other people as much. Um, you know, when you asked me earlier, who blows me away? Uh, maybe I should have just named some names, you know, and said, yeah, these people blow me away. You know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fan of, there's some great comics out there. I really, I enjoy Bill Burr. I really, I, you know, when you see a guy like Bill and he's successful, uh, I love that. I love when somebody that good is successful. I guess what I'm trying to figure out is there's no question you're talented and you're, you're great. What, let's take my first manager who you know, you interviewed was George Shapiro. Oh yes, I love George. And I what love. an impeccable reputation he had. And it's But when you stopped working together with him, did his reputation suffer a hit? Not at all. Why not? Well, it wasn't that big. <laughs> you know, it wasn't uh it wasn't uh it was interesting. That was an interesting day when I left when him. When Jeff Ross left, Bernie Brillstein, was that like a, did Bernie suffer a hit? No, no, that's not, uh, you know, I just think it's interesting. I think you're, you're when fascinating. When Norm Michaels left Brillstein Gray after Bernie died, did they suffer a hit? When, when Mike, you know, when Michael Rotenberg lost Chris Rock at Three Arts, does he, is he a bad manager? You know, it's, it's like, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, th I think that you have a valid point. And I think we all, um, that's one of the things we all have to be aware of as young artists and young executives is, is how we handle ourselves now will affect us in the future. And I'm sure there's a lot of things that have affected me negatively. Um, but, you know, I go back to New York, I, I walk into the comedy cellar and it's like they treat me like royalty. I walk into, mm -hmm. you know, the comedy clubs. They, it's, it's, it's the greatest feeling in the world. I don't even go that much because <laughs> it's so, it's almost overwhelming. Like, well, it's a long drive from Al from where you live. Like when I saw you at the, I forget what event it was. It was like overwhelming because it's like not just, you know, every level of comic from Judd to, to Adam Sandler to, I mean, yeah, you witnessed, you they, witnessed. They a, came up to me when I was with you. I did not say hello to, you remember that? I didn't say, hey, Judd, hey, Adam. They came up to me. Well, People you were, don't have to come up to you. Yeah, you were, you were with me. You know, Adam Sandler's a guy that we used to play basketball together at Shandling's house. And I was very competitive with, I mean, believe it or not, with Sandler. And he's not competitive with me, but I'm, you know, trying to block every one of his shots or get that shit out of here, you know, to the point that, you know, Judd put me in funny people to, you know, to play basketball with all those guys and talk shit. And I actually, uh, I actually, once Gary died, I, I felt like I was really immature at, at when I was at his house and at those games and just was, uh, you know, probably resentful for some of the, those other people's successes and, um, y you know, probably was too competitive and with, and I, and for some reason, Sandler, I felt most bad about, and I hadn't seen him in years, except at that event at the improv and you were with me and it, it almost makes me emotional. And Adam walked over, uh, to us 
and he had a mask on and he had a bunch of people around him and he could have just it was walked right Judd by. and another person, yeah. Yeah, and he he um he looked at me and said hi. I I didn't know who he was because he had the mask on and he lowered the mask and and just gave me a big hug. And it felt like, you know, it felt like something, you know, and I just wanted him to know, you know, hey man, you know, uh, and I think that that's part of this journey. And I think that people have to understand in order to get up on stage and to be on that stage every night and not only say, hey, I'm the funniest, I'm funnier than the, the eight people that are surrounded by me on this lineup, and I'm funnier than everybody sitting there in the audience, and the anxiety it causes every day, and the competitiveness, and why does he get that, and why does he, she get that, and, or, you know, it's, it's not easy. And you don't always have control, and there's growth. And I think that there's probably something very similar. You've had similar epiphanies and, and realizations. And I can see it just looking in your eyes, unless you're one of the greatest con men of all time. Maybe you are. I don't know. But well, I'm sure that's probably another thing on somebody's list. Too, <laughs> <laughs> one, one, two, three, five, cinco, six. Six degrees of separation. All right. Six degrees of separation. I'm going to mention some names. Tell me what comes to mind. Could be a word, a sentence, okay. a little tiny story, whatever. These are, I'm six degrees away from these people. Yeah. David Letterman. Genius. Put me on a show. Just genius. Just, you know, one of the best. Jerry Seinfeld. And I wish he'd shave his beard. Jerry Seinfeld. No thoughts. No thoughts. God, your nose just hit me in the chest. Why is that? Oh. Jay Leno. Love Jay. Jay's one of the, he's really, he, uh, and, I, and I'll just explain this about uh, Seinfeld. And I'm more than open to sitting down with him and having a conversation at one point. But we have a, you know, we've, we've got a past. And, um... You know, I don't, he was a very supportive and a friend at a time. And I w would, you know, wouldn't never talk publicly about a friend, uh, but um, I would talk to him privately. But Leno, Leno is a guy that, uh, you know, I've been doing a radio show on KFI here and Leno comes on as a guest and Leno calls me and Leno couldn't be more supportive. Uh, much love for him. I know I'm supposed to say one word. No, I said you can say whatever you want. Teen Wolf. One of the greatest uh, things to ever happen in my life. I was put in that project. I was written for perfectly. Love the cast, love the crew, love Jeff Davis who put me in that. Everybody is so supportive and the greatest fan base in the world. Awesome. Not judgmental like comedy fans. The movie Comedian. You know, it defines me. Brooke Shields said to me, uh, it's, it's your Blue Lagoon. <laughs> It's going to come up in every interview. and I went, I went an hour and a half. I didn't mention it. I know. It. It's unbelievable. I don't really discuss it anymore, but it's, it's what connects me and Seinfeld, and I can't run away from it. And I think it, um, uh, my appearance in it divides. You know, some people love me, some people can't stand me, and some people just don't understand me. But it's one of those things that I'll never understand as some, as me that's in it. It's like, you know what it's like? This is the better answer. Ask me that again. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to answer it like a politician. Go ahead. The movie comedian. I was in Beverly Hills <laughs> and I was, I was at a lunch with a manager and I saw coming down the street, the biggest paparazzi scrum I've ever seen. And I'm like, who is it? And as the person got closer, I noticed it was Paul McCartney. And I looked at Paul McCartney and I saw something in his eyes. I saw a guy that never enjoyed a Beatles song like I did. Never heard it for the first time. Never made out with a woman to it. He hears it and he thinks, John was a prick to me that day. I felt sick when we recorded it. He never gets to enjoy it the way I do. And he'll never understand his role 
in the world, he'll never understand his role in that song the way that I see it. And that's how I feel about comedian. Your proudest moment in show business. Well, besides this, uh, which I'm sure everybody says, my proudest moment, uh, my special, More Than Loud, which I shot for Showtime. And then you'll like the business. I bought it back from them. I put it up on YouTube. I put the sound up everywhere. It just, it just hit 5 million views on YouTube. And it's part of what's resurrected my career is people are seeing it and coming out to my shows. And I think it's really, and that's what we really need, should emphasize more than anything. Cause this came up earlier where you said, um, you know, you need these people or whatever. You don't need anybody anymore. Y yes, it helps. If, if I was on one of these big streamers tomorrow doing a new special, it would change my life overnight. But that doesn't mean that I can't produce my own podcast, put it up on the internet, on YouTube, put up specials, clips every day on TikTok, Instagram. I'm, I post nonstop. And that's the other thing. Teen Wolf, my specials, and then constantly producing material and putting it up has saved my career. And I think that that's, that's the real message that there is a system. And man, do I wish I worked within that system. Man, do I, and I do in many respects. I play all the improvs, I play all the big clubs. I, I'm on, I've been on The Tonight Show, I've been on Letterman, I've done that. I'm in this, but I'm not, I'm not right there. I'm not on all the streamers. But it doesn't mean the end of a career. You can still do it yourself. And I think that's really important. I just want to tell our audience something that I probably shouldn't tell them. To tell you what a great salesperson Orny Adams is. Without mentioning any names, uh, his former agent and manager um, was at uh, the company that owns several improvs all across the country. Now, if I'm a comic and I have a falling out with the person who is a manager at the place that owns all those comedy clubs, I might have a grudge against that person mm -hmm. and not book them in those comedy clubs. And the only way I would have to book them in those comedy clubs if his draw and his comedy are undeniable, which it is, and you work all those comedy clubs, who else in the world, after ending a relationship with a corporation like that, <clears throat> would still get to work those rooms? Think about it. It's a great testament to you. Thank you. Your biggest disappointment in show business and how you used it to fuel yourself to the next level. I, I think that uh, being in that documentary forced me to grow in a way that, uh, if anything, I'm most grateful for that. Have you forgiven me yet? Yeah, I, I, I have nothing but love for you because all these years later, you're still trying to give me advice like that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I think you mean well. I, I, I really do. And uh, why would I want to give you advice when I don't even represent? Because I, I, I genuinely want you to do well. I think you want it to be in the documentary. Do you think, look at me in the eyes. Yeah, I haven't stopped looking at you in the eyes the whole time. I, I noticed you keep averting because you, uh, you're falling in love with me. <laughs> uh, already, and that's okay. I already have. It's okay. But uh, shockingly, do you really think, look at me, do you I'm think, you. do you think, that I knew that there was a documentary and yes. when I walked in that Absolutely. room. Absolutely. Yes. Everybody knew. It was on the front page of the Montreal Gazette that Seinfeld's people were following me with the cameras. That's not what I said. Okay. Did you think when I walked in that dressing room that I knew that I was going to be filmed? That I don't know. If you had to take a guess. Well, b based on looking in your eyes right now, you're going to say no. But you didn't see the cameras? I didn't, even, following I didn't me. even know what was happening in that dressing room. I just walked in and you guys were there. Mm. Yeah. I don't know, but it, it doesn't matter. And I don't know if I was ever mad at you. I don't know if that's the emotion. I wasn't. Do you think that I was supposed to be in that documentary? 
No, I know you weren't. Okay. So <laughs> but you found you, your way in. Why didn't you say that? <laughs> but you found your way in. But I don't know why you would ask why I would so forgive you. So cut me. I've never, I've never, no, because it's a compelling, Cause you, cause it's a you, compelling moment. You I made it compelling. Action, you taped my action figure yeah. to my driver's side window like a vendetta, like I was going to be murdered. Yeah, yeah. No, I don't, uh, <laughs> listen. I don't know what I've felt at, at many points in this life. There was a voodoo pin in my uh, in my thing on the window with the tape. Yeah, no, that wasn't meant. But it, but it was it was time to get that that piece of shit Barry Katz action figure out of my life. It was on my on my uh, fireplace mantle, and I have an action figure too. And mine was laying down I on the still ground. Have yours. I'm gonna yeah. have to tape yours to you. I had I had mine laying down, and you standing over it, lecture, lecturing me <laughs> for years. I didn't know that. Yeah. I, by the way. I haven't shot a special since uh, I moved, and it's probably because I need that action figure back. I will give it back. I, I need it back. It's my 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 uh, you know good luck charm or whatever. Yeah, you know, yeah, you could it's stuff. Too, it's too small. You could stuff me as a taxidermist. It's too small. All right. Yeah. Anyway, last question. What advice do you have for the young comedian starting off in a town where it's a crazy situation? Um, trying to figure out how to navigate through all these different comedians, trying to navigate through the ups and downs and then have the kind of extraordinary, amazing success and career mm -hmm. that you're having right now. You know, it really depends what they want. If they, they want to be a viral sensation, then they should create clips every day and try and take off that way. If they want to be, uh, uh, you know, a monster on stage, which was always my objective, my objective was to be a great comedian. Then it's to, you have to get up on stage every single night. And I can tell you, I used to do maybe, I don't know what the number was, 30 sets a week in New York City, 25 sets a weekend. Like I would bounce around to every club, seven sets a night, up and down, up and down. And you just do it. And you just never stop working and writing. But you have to be on stage every single opportunity, and you better love it. And the minute you stop loving it, get out. Because the audience, they can feel that. And they don't need to see that. This isn't therapy. Gotta love it. Orny Adams, I just want to tell you something. You don't know what it's like to enjoy a conversation with you like I do. You don't know what it's like to... Uh, listen to your stand-up comedy as an audience member like I do. You don't know what it's like to observe somebody as a manager and see a comedian like you. Just like Paul McCartney. I like it. Thank you, pal. Thank you, this buddy. This is amazing. Yeah.